totally forgot that I was going to say one of the reasons I was talking to uh, Enjoy Their Own Records is because they talked. We talked for a while about putting the documentary out on VHS, which I would have thought no one's going to be able to watch it. I won't be able to watch it. But how cool would it be to have a VHS copy of it? But. Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to The Disconnected. I'm here with Jeff Smith, who is the director and producer behind Who Done It, the Clue documentary that has just recently released from ETR Media. And uh, there they are, both of our <laughs> screens. And and using the correct cover, I would say, ra- yes. rather than uh, the inside cover, which mocks the slipcover art. Yes, this there is a slipcover, which, you know, ETR thought, let's do that, and... And I said, sure. But yeah, this is the the artwork that uh, a gentleman that I've never met, but his name is Neil Fraser in England, did. And I absolutely love it. And I am self-indulgent enough that I put myself on the on the artwork. I'm located right underneath Leslie and Warren. Uh, and I don't know what day I decided I had the cojones to think <laughs> I needed to be on the poster with them. But... For those that watch the documentary, I'm in it a lot more. Yeah, there I am. If you're looking at the screen, at, uh, at least you're on the bottom. I am at the yeah. I'm like <laughs> I can be cropped easily uh, if need be because the very first version that he did, I was not actually I wasn't on there, and neither was Jonathan Lind, who's the director of Clue. And Interesting I said, choice I there him because he's in the documentary a lot. Yeah, and then, uh, this was still while I was making it, and I was starting to pop in more than I thought I would. And it, the documentary was kind of evolving into uh, a filmmaker's journey kind of thing. And so I thought, all right, if I were watching this and I had no connection to it, I I wouldn't be thrown off that the director's on the poster because he's in it a lot. And I'd had to, because I'm not very, I don't have, I'm very, uh, there's no ego, basically. I, I, if anything, I'm very self-deprecating. And so that's why it's weird now to look at me all over the artwork and go, what day was I feeling good about myself that I thought that was a good idea? Because if I probably slept on it, I would have gone, forget it, forget it. That's lame. (laughs) I I think I imagine all these because it's a very cool poster. It's very cool artwork that Neil did. And I imagine like the Clue fan that's like, oh, I I don't need to see the documentary, but I like the poster. And then they see, but who's the jackass (laughs) on the front in the hoodie that doesn't match anybody and it's me it's me it's the hoodie for me that that's what sets it up yeah i don't match anybody in it at all the casual documentarian all right so uh i mean first of all you are a fan that released a documentary which is not a common thing so let's let's dive into that you brought up in the actual documentary the uh there was a couple that came out around what 2017 2018 that made some some minor waves so is that what was the the genesis behind all of this definitely there were three in in particular uh there was a a documentary called back in time which is about back to the future there's one called uh, the shark is still uh, yeah the shark is still working uh about jaws and then there was one called the psycho legacy which was not just about psycho but it was about the sequels which i thought good for him because i really uh, to a degree, like the Psycho sequels. I think Psycho 2 is very underrated, uh, yeah. which if anyone has seen Scream 6 yet, they actually say that in Scream 6, Psycho 2 is is, uh, is underrated, which I thought that's Interesting. Brilliant. So I thought, how cool that somebody dug a little deeper than, because Back to the Future is pretty obvious. Again. Jaws is pretty obvious. And they also already have really good, at the time, really good DVD and Blu-ray releases of special features. Uh, Back to the Future DVD, I remember really liking because it had multiple commentary tracks. There was a Bob yeah. Gale, there was a Q and A with Bob Gale and Robert Zemeckis at a film. I was probably at USC, and so they were done. So I was just enjoying that fans made these documentaries, and they're of degree and quality. The part what I like about Psycho Legacy is a lot of it is um, convention footage of Anthony Perkins because he's passed away a while ago, but it worked. They got away with it. It looks like they filmed it on their home video camera, which is probably what they did, but it's still. I liked that kind of uh, do-it-yourself kind of feel to it. And I thought, well, any, that's cool. 
And then Clue has always been one of my favorite movies. And I, there's not, at the time, was not a lot of information on the making of Clue. Even if you were going on IMDb trivia, it would be, there were multiple endings. Like, yeah, we know. <laughs> uh, or the when the DVD came out, special features, three endings. Like, no, that's, right. not, that's, that's how the movie was made. It's not a special feature. So I just thought, nobody's going to make... The Paramount just seemed they were in no rush. And Paramount doesn't do a lot of really big releases. Universal's getting really good with uh, releases, but Paramount still hasn't yep. jumped on the ball. Um, thank goodness, because during this five years I was making it, I thought <laughs> eventually they might do it, and then I'm up. I'm been waiting. Well, and the funny thing is they have kind of started doing some of it, but yeah. Clue always is the redheaded stepchild. They haven't gotten to it. They, yeah, they'll, they'll give some love to like Airplane. Yeah. Uh, and stuff like that. But so they hadn't done Clue. And so, again, another one of those weird spur of the moments, much like the poster art. I thought, uh, you know what? Uh, I had discovered you can go on IMDb Pro and there's contact information for everybody. Some of it is just, you know, the CAA or right. their representatives, but some of it, it's their actual, it's their email address. It's a Gmail account. So I thought, all right, well, I'll just email whoever's still around from Clue and didn't even say, is it okay if I make a documentary? I was feeling very ballsy that day <laughs> and emailed them and said, I am making a documentary about Clue. May I interview you? And the first person that got back to me was Jonathan Lynn, who was the writer and director. And he said, yeah, okay, I'm in New York. And I was living in California at the time. Uh, but he said, yeah, come on to my house, come to my apartment in New York. And I went, oh, I better get a camera. Uh, <laughs> because I was a, a film major, but I that was years and years ago, and I really hadn't done anything with that film degree uh, worth noting. So it wasn't like I just had all my equipment sitting around waiting for this right. opportunity. It was really just, he probably emailed me at the end of March of 2017, and I was on a plane on the 31st of March flying to New York, and I had to interview him twice because the first time was the uh, the sound didn't work. <laughs> the, I, got, I bought these lavaliers that I didn't know I should test. And I uh, got back home and it's everybody's nightmare where you get home and you now you watch it and just hear, I'm like, oh no. So I emailed them back and I was too proud to say that's what happened. I just said, hey, I thought of a bunch of, because he said at the end, he was so nice. He said, if you have any other questions, we can do this again. He was so yeah. super nice. I think he was surprised that he's very surprised that Clue has the the love that it has. Um, I think he's tickled by it that people like it so much. Where he'll say like people come up to him and say Clue's my favorite movie, and he'll say, "Have you seen The Godfather?" <laughs> uh, but he's so he said, "Can you can come back anytime?" So I emailed him back and said, "Hey, I thought of more questions." And either he was polite or didn't remember that I asked him 90% of the exact same questions. Uh, so if you see in the documentary, the very first shot of him, he's wearing one blue shirt. And then there's a cutaway. And then when it cuts, and it's just all you hear is me say, like, how did you get started with Clue? And he starts to answer. That's like the only audio that worked for the first one. And then he continues it, and that's months later. And he's got a different shirt, and the sound is better, and the framing's a little better. You could just see slight improvement uh, <laughs> since what I thought. Okay, I better kind of have an idea of what I'm going to do. It's just a really long interview. We'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah, you know, months and months. It is a long interview. He's in it a lot, but he's hilarious. He has some of the best lines. He tells a story about how Carrie Fisher was originally cast as Miss Scarlet. Yeah. And in the screenings that we've had, he gets uh, the best laughs from telling the story about what happened to Carrie Fisher and why she is not Miss Garland. Uh, well, he doesn't hold back at all either. <laughs> no. Well, that's the other funny story. He So Lee Ving, uh, famously the lead singer of a punk band called Fear, plays Mr. Body. And that was definitely a casting the studio wanted that he, uh, John Lind, didn't care for. He didn't necessarily want a, a rock singer playing this part. So he's so adorable, uh, John Delin, because I asked him how that how, how that casting happened, and I kind of knew. But I asked him, and he said, um, that was the studio's uh, suggestion, and I can't really say anything more than that. <laughs> and I say, okay, interesting. But what I will say, and then he just goes on for about yep. five more minutes about how <laughs> he hated the casting, how he, he gave him the smallest part he possibly could. 
Um, Lee Bing uh, in the movie is actually dubbed. It's not his actual voice, which I don't know why. I don't, it's never really explained why. I only know that because Michael McKeon uh, told me that in his interview. And his voice is similar enough that I don't know exactly why he did it. Yeah, it's an odd choice. His spite. I think he probably went, and you know what? Your voice is that you're most famous for. Your voice is not even going to be in the movie. (laughs) That's my theory. I don't know if that's true. But that's what I would do. Because spite is an excellent motivator, I think. Especially in Hollywood. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, when you're forced (laughs) to do something. Yeah, it's just just childish enough that I would do the exact same thing. So kudos, Mr. Jonathan Lynn. And it's honestly, it's a very punk rock move to to kind of give that back. punk rock to mess with the punk rocker. Yeah. Who, when I interviewed, I didn't know. I interviewed Lee Ving before I interviewed Michael McKeon, so I didn't actually know. I did, had no idea that wasn't his voice, and he never mentioned it because if I had known, I would have brought it up. Uh, right. But that I, that information came later. So to me, I think there's two two big things to walk away from watching this. And one obviously is to get inspired to go back and watch Clue 27 more times in the next couple <laughs> of weeks. Uh because it's one of the best films of all time. But okay. the second thing is watching this and going, well, I mean if Jeff can do this, what do I love enough to do something like this? Yeah. So uh, other than contacting people, like what what all did it take to do something like this? Well, the contact was a big deal because uh it, I was very blessed that that the director said yes first because I think that made it easier to get the others. Not everybody participated. Um, Christopher Lloyd is not in it, but I think it's because he doesn't. I don't think he remembers a lot about Clue, and I think the same thing happened with uh, Jane Weedland, who plays the singing telegram girl from the Go Go's. Um, they did respond. It took a while to get Christopher Lloyd to respond, but when he did, uh, he just said his person said, you know, no, thank you. But from what I've heard since then is just they, they don't have a lot of memories. I mean, the singing telegram girl is not in the movie that long. Or but I would have been happy with sitting down with her and have her saying, I don't remember. And I would say, all right. And then that would have been it. That would have been worth yeah. setting up for an hour and then tearing down for an hour. But I think um, that's why they're not there. But I'm sure I got Michael McKeon and Colleen Camp and Leslie and Warren and Jeffrey Kramer and Lee Ving because and, all, and a lot of the crew because Jonathan Lynn said yes. So getting the right person, and I, that was advice I got uh, from Lee LaShawn, who was a producer on Back in Time. He was nice enough. When I first started doing this, I had mentioned in an article that I think uh, Bloody Disgusting had posted just that, hey, somebody's doing this from 2017. And I had mentioned Back in Time in that. So I'm sure he has like a Google search for whenever that title comes on. And so I popped right. up in his email. And so he contacted me and I talked to him for like an hour and he was giving me advice on on things like fair use and how to get people to show up. And his his big thing was he got Bob Gale on board for Back to the Future, for Back in Time. And he also did a documentary about Ghostbusters called Ghost Heads and he got Ivan Reitman uh, on board for that. And so the key is to get somebody important so... It's kind of like going to a party and seeing the cool kids are already there, then or a <laughs> restaurant that has right. people already there. Uh, it's the hardest part is getting the first person, and then if they show up, then because they always ask, well, "Who else have you talked to?" If they respond, they respond yeah. with, "Who else have you talked to?" So uh, that certainly helps. And I hope that having finished this one, the Clue documentary will help me on the next one to say, so I'm not just somebody out of nowhere saying, you know, can I do a documentary? Because I could say, right. I've done one. So that's the first, that's the, the big step to get those people. But a lot of the Clue documentary evolved because at first I thought it was just going to be kind of like uh, special features on a DVD that was never made. But over the years, I started meeting a lot more Clue fans than I even knew existed. At first, I thought, oh, this would be fun for me. And then I would post clips of the interviews on YouTube or, or our website. And then Clue fans just started showing up. And, and um, it's, a lot of them are the special thanks because they've been contributors. If you go on our Instagram or on our Facebook, um, you'll see the same names pop up a lot. Uh, with comments and a lot of times it'll break into dialogue quotes that just go on and on forever if someone says one plus two plus two plus one you're going to get to the end of that ending with quotes from from these guys so the documentary kind of evolved on its own about being 
not just the making of the movie. That's kind of the first half. And then the second half is about what the what clue means to people like me. So the title is actually very appropriate, Who Done It, because it's not just who done it as far as who made the movie, it's who's made the movie live. Right. Life after death. Yeah, and there's there's a lot. Clue is one of those movies that has a, a, a genuine legacy. It's something that people have attached to. It's not uh, necessarily in the zeitgeist every day, but if you find that right person, yeah. it is everywhere in their lives. Yeah, that, that's, that was a very nice surprise uh it's definitely it's helped because you know the blu-ray when it came out it was the the slip cover version we were talking about a thousand of those were made and they sold out in 24 hours yeah but i didn't necessarily know that many people were were lurking that knew about the documentary but um i'm glad because <laughs> it helps after working on it for five and a half years it makes it definitely worth it and and the feedback has been nice so i think the what people respond to is they can feel the i mean the filmmaking as far as technique is not stellar it's a lot of it is shot on my iphone i admit it and i thought if i ever get a review uh that'll probably be the first thing it looks like just some guy that likes clue made the movie <laughs> that's what it is but a lot of people like that part of it and a lot of the the good uh, feedback I get is you could tell this guy loves Clue, um, and that's why he did it, which is why I did it. So I'm glad that comes across. And it's the reason that you can tell is because it's not just surface level. A lot of the the aspects of Clue over the years that have been uh, I don't really want, necessarily want to say lost because a lot of the people that know about Clue they they've been around, but the aspects of Clue that seems to get promoted. It's just the same, you know, like kind of like you mentioned in IMDb trivia at the beginning. It's the, a few simple things just regurgitated over and over. And this yeah. is a lot of different information, like where the, the driveway was filmed. That's not something that you're going to learn about on IMDb trivia. Yeah, that's that, it's true. And that's why uh, part of the story of the documentary is also the, the people that made the soundtrack happen, which... Paramount, again, another thing they weren't ever going to do anything with. They had, you know, in the archives, the great John Morris score that, um, you know, was never released. And it took fans um, in high places like La La Land Records yeah. to, and their company is amazing because they do release soundtracks that we all, people my age, wished had come out back in the day. Um, so we didn't have to just put our tape recorders next to the TV and, and record the you know the score from dirty rotten scoundrels or right. what else did i have definitely clue uh well beetlejuice had a soundtrack but for the most part the ones from the 80s didn't have a lot of score soundtracks um so la la Land records uh, is a big company now but also fans of that kind of stuff and that's why i'm happy they're in the the documentary as well because it has taken fans to decide you know it, there's no such thing as an official Clue movie t-shirt. So someone like uh, Mike DeFrancisco decides, I'm going to make an Etsy store, and I want a shirt that says Mrs. Peacock was a man. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> no one else is going to do it. So it's fun to see how people don't, that love this movie don't just love it in the way of, oh, that's fun, I, I like watching it, but they've done something with it creatively. And not only did it take fans to do it, the whole La Land, La La Land thing, Hard that to took say. 25 yeah. years. It, it's yeah. not something that was, uh, you know, even just a handful of years after the film released that we have literally like an entire generation of film fans that suffered until we got good <laughs> yes. releases of some of this stuff. It's true. And now you can have, well, they're, they go out of print really fast. Speaking of selling out. Uh, you know, the CD's gone, the vinyl keeps coming out from Mondo and then Enjoy the Ride Records. It's the whole reason this documentary is released by Enjoy the Ride. They're really a record company and they've just started doing uh, DVDs yeah. and Blu-rays. And I hooked up with them because they were releasing a vinyl uh, a couple of, it was like a year and a half ago. They were releasing the soundtrack on vinyl and I was promoting it on our stuff our social media after i bought mine because i knew it was going to sell out so i ordered my vinyls and then posted hey clue fans <laughs> i don't know if you know but go get them i totally was selfish and got mine first because that was sold out really fast that day 
and then just started talking with Ross, who's the the guy at Enjoy the Ride Records, who's also a fan as well. I uh, I've had Ross on the channel, and it was nice to see oh. him show up in the documentary. Yeah, no, Ross is good. So after after that whole process of getting in contact with Ross and getting to know ETR, how uh, how exactly did this come about? Is, is there any fun parts of the process behind the actual physical side that you'd like to share? Um, <laughs> that's, some... that's what we talk about all the time, as you can see. Behind yeah, definitely. Me. I know. I, I I love that this. Well, just to be able to hold the movie is it's a is big deal. Freaking cool. Yeah. yeah. This. Um, it's it's certainly not perfect. There are some bonus features listed on here that didn't somehow make it to the Blu-ray. So let's explain uh, that with sure. the website. Yes. I've got it visible on the on the there screen. There it is. There it is. So these are clips that were originally. If you read the back, it says special features. Um, there is a documentary by another filmmaker that he made called "The Evidence Found and Clues Soundtrack Feature." App. I didn't have anything to do with that one, but it's on there. And then there's supposed to be additional interview footage not included in the film. And if you're looking on the screen, those are those clips. And then a podcast interview with director Jeff Smith about the film. And that also didn't make it to the Blu-ray. So a lot of people thought we were just being really cheeky uh, with the mystery. And, they, and so I got a lot of emails going, how do I find it? How do I find yeah. it? And I hadn't really uh, watched I didn't get a proof or anything. I got it with everybody else. In fact, I found out it was available. I knew it was coming out, obviously, and I had seen the artwork beforehand, but I didn't get a disc beforehand. I found out it was coming out. Uh, for. I knew it was available for pre-order the day it came out for pre-order. Uh, Ross had emailed me, and I was at work, and he said, hey, it's up. And I thought, <laughs> I, I, he had told me it was probably going to be in March, but this was early February. And he's like, hey, it's up. I'm like, oh, I hope it's okay. <laughs> and uh, so then uh, I, I ordered it myself through the site because that's what you have to do. If you if you make them, they, I mean, I have some that I got wholesale through the, the right. company, but I also had to buy one because that's freaking cool. Yeah. And so I got mine in the mail, even a couple of days after some people ordered it, even in the UK. Some people were sending me pictures like, I got my Blu-ray. I'm like, I don't have one. Um, <laughs> good for them. And then during that time, uh, I had a house guest living with me for a while that had camped out on the couch. Uh, who So I didn't have access to the Blu-ray player. So even when it came, I wasn't and he didn't move so i had no chance to to watch it so i didn't know that there was a trouble with the blu-ray uh until people started emailing going how do i find it so then i emailed ross and went is it on there and then he emailed the manufacturer and paraphrasing said oops and uh said what do you want to do and i said well i'll Put them online, then I guess, because the only because uh, hopefully I would imagine since it's sold out so fast, there's a chance that they'll want to do uh, a reprint. Yeah. Um. So it, hopefully by then it'll be fixed. There is also an error in the titles. First of all, there is an error in the subtitles. If you watch it with the closed captioning, they're all over the place. The company <laughs> that made them had a had trouble with some of the Jonathan Lynn. Yeah. Uh, dialogue he's good and i didn't bother changing any of that at all because i thought it was hilarious so uh it's kind of like when you watch on youtube clips like you you're looking at the yeah. caption what i think there's one part where he's talking about mr green but it says something about a turtle yep and I'm like that's great I, don't, I wouldn't change that for the world so that could stay but the last screening we had in uh uh, Santa Ana, California. One of the guys that actually appears at the end of the documentary in the testimonial section, who says uh, how much he loves Clue and how it makes his day better, he was in the audience. And afterwards, he comes up and he said, "Hey, I didn't want to say this during the Q and A, but there's a mistake." And I said, "Oh, okay. What's that?" And he said, "So Michael Kaplan, who's the costume designer, um, when his title comes on, it says Michael Kramer." And I'm like, Psh, I would have noticed that because I'm like super Mr. Typo oh, no. guy. I'm like, that's okay, fine, thanks, Nick. I uh, goes, no, it's on there, it's on there. And I thought, so then I'm driving back to the hotel, thinking, I did do all those titles on the same day, and there is an actor named Jeffrey Kramer, 
in the movie. And I probably made his title the same day as Michael Kaplan in there. And I can totally see just typing away, doing the K, and then yep. just bleep, going away in my mind and typing Kramer. And that's so specific. that, And it is somebody's name. I'm like, it could have happened. So I get to the hotel and I've got, you know, the movie on my phone. So I'm like, blip, blip, blip. Yep. Sure it's, enough. It's Michael Kramer. So I have changed it for future uh, editions and screenings. So it's back to normal. But it, like an upside down <laughs> airplane on a stamp in Brewster's Millions, this Blu-ray here not only is missing most of the special features, <laughs> But it says, and the, but Michael Kaplan, it says his name in the movie, and then there's a clip of his actual title from the opening credits. So you will see his real name in it and in the credits and everything. But the first time it pops on, it says Michael Kramer. And there's, well, I'm sure there is a person called Michael Kramer, but he has nothing to do with clip. So those are my funny little fun stories of, of the physical media that uh, if you own this version, now you now you know. And that could be in, on my IMDb trivia that uh, the idiot filmmaker didn't get the name of the costume designer for Clue. Maybe it'll be a like first pressing unique Easter egg. That yeah, it, that's <laughs> that's what I thought. I'm like, because uh, yeah, I didn't get too upset. Because I'm like, okay, if I were a fan, I would probably be more amused by that. Yeah, and it just kind of goes with that do it yourself uh, vibe of the whole documentary. Like, well, of course he messed up on the on one of the titles. It was just him for five years. Well, and you know, it's hilarious. I fell prey to the mystery aspect too, because I read all the special features and I was like, I'm going to watch all of these because I love the movie. So I go to the menu and I see one special feature. And I'm like, there's yeah. no way they forgot all of them. So I'm pressing all the directional buttons. I'm like, yeah. they've got to be the hidden here. School, yeah. uh, Easter eggs. I would have loved that. Uh, and maybe that will be the joke on the next pressing uh, <laughs> that uh, we do hide them. Uh, the nice thing is now on the next one, I could probably put more clips because there's other interview things that, that uh, I could put on there. And now we just, yeah, now we have to stack it with special that's, features. That's true. That's there's... my favorite thing. I'm like from the days of talking about physical media. When I was in high school, the whole reason I got a job in high school was to buy laser discs. Nice. Because, uh, that was the only way you could see, you know, widescreen yeah. and uh, commentary. I thought that was the greatest invention of all time. I can Absolutely. watch. The War of the Roses and listen to Danny DeVito talk about it for the whole time. Favorite. And that's, you know, Laserdisc, as you know, were like the good Criterion ones were $150 and easily. You know, yeah, there were sales and once a year at the store I'd go to where people would line up because it would be 40% off and they would just walk out of there like the collectors full of, and I was one of them. Like we all walk out of Barnes and Noble nowadays with Blu-rays. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then eventually I thought, oh, these are worthless and tossed them. I kept some. Like I still have my This is Spinal Tap Laserdisc because mm. it has the commentary by the guys out of character. Um, so then the DVD came out and they did it in character, which is hilarious. Yeah. But it was the commentary with them out of character on Criterion was very cool. And I think they did release it on very limited DVD at, when it first came out. But I don't know if you can get it anymore. So obviously, somebody that's going to go through all the time to do a Clue documentary is going to be somebody that loves film. You have mentioned film school. How, how did we get here in Jeff's life? What, what has led up to this? What led to this very day being on that? Disconnect? That and you making a movie and loving oh, okay. that. And then off before we were recording, you said you, you work at a movie theater now. There, there's a lot that goes into that. People have to really have a passion to make a life like that. Yeah. Um, well, the, the reason I like movies and, and making movies now is it's kind of a weird... It's from the Michael Jackson Thriller video. Um, because back in the day, I'm old, um, when they made Michael Jackson's Thriller video directed by John Landis, producer of Clue and co-writer, um, he uh that was like the biggest music video of all time it's, oh, it's, yeah. it's probably the greatest still music video of all time because it's, it's a short yeah. it's a short film basically and it was super expensive so to help finance it they released it on home video with a making of feature at the end and young eight or nine year old jeff had never seen it and it was rick baker and it was makeup and it was it showed how zombies came out of the grave and it showed it just it was showed everything how to make a monster yeah. movie 
and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And uh, we didn't buy that video, but I certainly rented it a lot. So anytime we'd go to a video palace up by our house, I would rent it so much that the clerk eventually gave it to our family because he said, you have <laughs> rented this well, because this is back when movies, I don't, Thriller probably wasn't this much, but to buy a VHS, it was like $99. Yes. Yeah. So you had to really like that movie. I think we had two. We had Karate Kid and we had The Natural. And then eventually we, yeah, those are two. <laughs> uh, I love, they're both great. They're both good. Uh, they just don't go together. <laughs> they're odd. Well, they're both kind of sports movies. Uh, kind of. Uh, and I can't hear the, the TriStar logo from the 80s without thinking of The Natural. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so then we had Thriller. So I used to just like watch the making of Thriller over and over again. And that's how I found out how, how movies are made. And I like knowing um, tricks. I like knowing how the tricks are done. So yeah. to see like the, the curtain peel back, I thought was amazing. So that's what got me interested in, in movies. And then sometimes movies would have special uh, behind the scenes if they were promoting. I remember right before Jaws the Revenge came out, they had a half hour special on Channel 5 in, in California uh, that showed the making of Jaws the Revenge. And I thought, this is going to be the best movie ever. <laughs> this looks so good. Oh, well, to be young and innocent. <laughs> it's not, but I, but, and I do have, uh, speaking of another passion project, there's a book about the making of Jaws the Revenge called The Shark is uh, Still Roaring. Because Jaws at the end of Jaws of Revenge, when he's coming out of the water before he dies, sorry, um, he roars like a dinosaur. No vocal cords, but he does. <laughs> but uh, a guy, I forget his name, unfortunately, but he wrote a whole book about the making of Jaws of Revenge. And I'm like, good for that dude. Because again, Jaws has been covered. Jaws of Revenge, not so much. But Jaws, the Revenge has a special place in my heart because I've seen the behind the scenes footage about how or that showed how some the scenes were done. So I just liked watching all that. And then, uh, yeah, I went to film school and kind of sat on that for a while. I, fortunately, I'm not a very good student. So the second anything becomes school, I don't like it as much anymore. So once I went into school, I suddenly didn't, I, then it became like a chore and I didn't like doing it anymore. So I just really didn't do anything. And then, um, a few years later, a, a bunch of friends and I made like a super low budget, uh, like horror movie based, like a parody of 80s horror movies and for like zero dollars. And that got distribution because it had nudity. And that's all, <laughs> that's all it takes. So, it's you know, ticket, yeah. yeah, absolutely. They got, you know, definitely for a distribution and never saw a dime of it. But that was mainly because by the end of making the movie, all of us that made it ended up hating each other. So we had to, if we ever got residual checks, uh, we all three of us had to sign them and we couldn't all be in the same room together. So we never <laughs> signed the check. So it was the best deal ever for this distribution company. And then that's gone way out of print, which is probably for the best because it's not awesome. I think it's hilarious, but it's done. It's very tongue in cheek. And if you don't know it's supposed to be fun, you'll just think it's bad. And then, so after that, I didn't do anything with that either. I, I, co-founded uh, a horror film festival in California and did that for about three years. And that was fun watching other people's stuff and um, saw, I just did that with one other person. So we watched a lot of fun, cool little indie horror movies and a lot of really, 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 really bad uh, horror movies. But since we had been down the, the filmmaker side of that, we watched them all because we knew yeah. how much effort it took and, and you had to spend money. You had to pay to submit the film festivals. So I did that for a while. And then just kind of got in a weird slump of doing nothing and then had this weird clue epiphany. And it took, I don't, it, I thought it would be quick. How long could this take? It took five years. Wow. It's not like I was working on it every day for five years, but there were long periods of time. Because I also hate, this may be a surprise since I talk so much in this interview, but I hate the sound of my own voice. So when I'd start to watch it, the interview footage and hear me asking questions, right. the sound of me just, no, 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 tell me about <laughs> the movie. Uh, that's usually what I would do. My fiance would be in the next room. She'd hear me like making fun of myself and then like stopping the computer. Go, I can't hear myself today. So... That, for me, was the hardest part, hearing my dumb questions or watching the footage going, why didn't you ask this question, stupid? Um, yeah. 
So that's what, and then yeah, finishing it was uh, quite an accomplishment, but here we are. That's how. Well, and honestly, that leads to a good question. When you're looking at something like this, how how do you know it's the end for you? Because with documentaries, yeah. there is no there is no actual ending until you put a button on the story, and it's all about your vision. Yeah, is that? I think it's a is it Robert Zemeckis quote: "You don't finish a film, you abandon it." Yep. Um, and that's certainly true with this. And I I've had about over the years about ten different versions of of this documentary and i'm glad i didn't release the other ones because they weren't uh i didn't like them as much now looking back but uh yeah i this could have gone on forever because i waited a long time to get some interviews that never happened right. um and i could still be waiting like i'm still waiting for martin mull to call me back and that hasn't happened yet so i finally just decided okay martin mull is not calling and he may call tomorrow and i'll say okay <laughs> and I'll, <laughs> I'll figure out a way to, to re-edit or if tim curry calls uh then i'll i'll throw him in there too but uh yeah eventually it's just enough is enough <laughs> or if it, or you just you watch it and go okay i'm satisfied with this is this works this is there's a story here uh the you know there's the hard part is like deciding what to, to cut sometimes, you right. know, it's the, cause they'll go on and on with great stories that just don't fit. Like Michael McKeon, I think the clips on YouTube still, one of my favorite movies that's kind of a guilty pleasure that he's in is called radio land murders. And it's from the early nineties. It's produced by George Lucas. It's kind of similar to clue where it's a comedy based around a murder in the thirties or forties around old radio. And Michael McKeon's in it, Christopher Lloyd's in it. Uh, George Burns is in it, um, huge cast. And he kind of went off on this long tangent about the making of Radio Land Murders, which I loved, but you know, it doesn't fit. It was hard not asking him about Spinal Tap. That was the thing with some of these people that I wanted to ask them about some of the other things they had done, but you know, right. I had an hour. Let's keep on topic. Because <laughs> Michael McKean was probably the one, the, of all of them I was most starstruck with just because yeah. I grew up with Laverne and Shirley and uh love spinal tap and i would have done a documentary about spinal tap but that's also very well covered territory and it should be them it should be some weirdo well and while I, I imagine while you interviewed him he was probably during uh better call salt time as well yeah that too that too so that was yeah there was a lot like michael kaplan not kramer uh the <laughs> costume designer He's done a million things since Clue. Clue was his right. second movie, and he did Blade Runner, and he did. He was just about to the next day fly to England for uh, the Last Jedi. <laughs> I should have warned him. Little, uh, little uh, indie film, The Last Jedi. Little, yeah. yeah, a little something like that. <laughs> but at the time, I thought that's pretty. That's pretty cool. It's gonna be awful, <laughs> but uh, I don't like Last Jedi. But I love the costumes. But uh, yeah, that was, and then, yeah, he did the costumes for National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. So I wanted to ask all about Cousin Eddie's outfits. But right. uh, guys, it's all, it was all Clue. Well, and he, uh, when you see him in the film, I think this is the one I'm thinking of. He is very, very young. Yeah, that's so funny you would say that. I just got an email from one of the, uh, the guys that's in one of the testimonials. And he said, how old is he? Because right. <laughs> between him and Leslie Ann Warren... <laughs> Uh, I don't know what their diet is, but they look um, they look younger than me. They look amazing. Yep. And yeah, I don't yeah, I was definitely surprised when he walked in the door. <laughs> Your dad here? I did the nineteen eighty five math and I was like, wait, this does this can't be yeah. real. <laughs> well, let's say he's twenty one, maybe. Like young right. costume designer, fine. That's still 1985. <laughs> yeah. And he, yeah, his skin is so smooth and his hair is perfect. And he's just, he's a good looking guy. And he's just, yeah, <laughs> he's living the, the good life. Good. Yeah. He's Michael Kaplan is taking care of himself. Hollywood Michael ages Kaplan some people himself. and he's just been drinking the elixir of life. I don't know. It might be monkey's brains <laughs> popular in Cantonese cuisine, not often to be found in Washington, D.C. Well, uh, other than horror parodies, and now you've got this under your belt, what's next? Yeah. Um, I've started interviewing, <laughs> this is even more obscure, and either people, more people say I've never heard of this than 
oh, that's cool you're doing it. So one of the movies I watched a lot growing up because of the same video store was a movie called Midnight Madness. And it's Michael J. Fox's first movie. Yep. It's Disney's second PG movie after The Black Hole. It was supposed to be their answer to Animal House. They were just starting to try to do more grown-up stuff or teen stuff. And it's a it's a and David Naughton from American World of London. I just interviewed him a couple weeks ago. And uh, he, that was another stay on topic. Talk yeah. about Midnight Madness, not <laughs> American World of London. Uh, and so I started interviewing the uh, people from that. And that I do not expect. I mean, I may be surprised. I was surprised about the, the love of Clue. Don't expect it to be the same. But it's just, it's another one of these movies that has a weird place in history because it was during Dis a weird time in Disney. It was yeah. 1979, 1980. So that's kind of fascinating. And I've already interviewed, there were two directors that had done, they had done a short film with a young Paula Abdul before Midnight Madness, a short musical. And they were basically given the keys to the kingdom for a while until the studio decided, oh, we're not going to promote this at all. And yeah. then it just vanished. But it is famous for being Michael J. Fox's first movie. So I'd love to get Michael J. Fox. And the first thing I'm going to ask Michael J. Fox is, what's up with your friend Christopher Lloyd? How come he didn't want to be in my documentary? Because I get, I get spiteful too. Um, so I want to do that. I've started doing that. But also when I was watching the screening of, of the Clue documentary, at the very end of this, there's a really short montage, and it's during a scene where uh, John Hatch, who's an author of a book about Clue that's about to come out in November, um, he has this little, very well said moment where he talks about how much 80s, movies in the 80s and for our generation mean to people and how it really helped you develop because it's before yeah. there was all the multimedia. This was pretty much it, but it was also a time when now we could finally, with home video and cable, we could start watching the movies over and over and over again. So they really made um, an impact on our personalities and who we became. And while he's talking about that, I just roll these clips of basically the, all the movies that I grew up personally watching that I could fit in while he's talking. And two of them are The Karate Kid and The Natural. Um, <laughs> they're both in there. But it shows clips from uh, Ghostbusters and Fletch and Bad News Bears and and just all these greats. And it's a part where they, they add, the people that have seen it ask about it in the Q&A. They just kind of react to it. And it's kind of, it's, I wouldn't say it's an emotional thing, but it's a, the relatable part. Yeah. Where people go, oh, yeah, th that's true. That, that does do affect me. And it, it affects why people have podcasts. It affects why people... Uh, have conversations can talk about a, a movie for two hours on on a podcast and i thought that it's it's a broad topic but it would be interesting to kind of do what i did with clue but stretch it out and not just have it be about one movie but have it be that way you know i can interview one person from like cloak and dagger and uh then talk to people that love cloak and dagger yeah. or talk to people and, and just do one like that and that, that could be a whole series of things so I'll finish Midnight Madness because I've started Midnight Madness, but I think that's going to be the next thing. And then trying to find people that were in like the Lost Boys or people that were in the Burbs or that's both Corey Feldman. But uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe I'll talk to Corey Feldman. I would love to talk to Corey Feldman. Actually, he's been in the Goonies and the Burbs and Lost Boys and, and oh, yeah. License to Drive. He's He'd be prime. I mean, that would be a huge get for sure. I need to talk to you. <laughs> I'll follow you. I will. Uh, I'll, I'll reach out to his people. Thank you. <laughs> I'll buy I mean, the album if that if that helps. Uh, it it does sound like a good opportunity to get rid of uh you know the the thoughts behind the first Michael J. Fox film for you. So I'm glad that that's getting out there, and it does have a fan base. I will say that it has come up a lot in the last couple of years, especially surrounding the topic of Disney because they don't do hardly anything with physical media which i yeah. talk about a lot they they don't promote a lot of the stuff that they're uh we'll say keeping in the vault for now <laughs> yeah. uh, uh but some of those they really had a major effect on a lot of us and unfortunately when it's not accessible you don't get to share that love as much so these type of passion projects they really go a long way yeah yeah definitely and, and sometimes the the keepers of the kingdom are not the people that own the kingdom it's the, the little court jesters off to the side that uh, gather together and and quote their favorite movies on you know for 
hours at a time. That's all they say is just quote, quote, quote. Even if that is the magic kingdom, that's for sure. That's right. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for your time today. I hope people check this out again. Who done it? The clue documentary is available on the vinegar syndrome website and it will be available retail widely. Uh, soon yeah. when they get more in. Definitely, hopefully, and then uh, we're working on streaming. Everybody asks, when can it stream? And I would love for it to be streaming too. And there's a couple of different ways that's possibly gonna happen. It's just a matter of some people are cool with fair use. Some people are nervous about fair use. So it's finding somebody a little more brave that is not scared of uh, Paramount Pictures. Sounds like we might be seeing something on Tubi soon then. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your time. Uh, hopefully we can talk again someday. Thanks, Ryan. This was fun. <laughs>